Hey everyone, I just wanted to take a minute and go through this article that you're going to be reading. I think that's this is something you're really going to enjoy. So uh, it kind of builds on my last lecture of what the patent system is all about and gives you some specifics. So as you go through it, there's some things you might want to pay attention to. So right here on the first page, it talks about Jefferson and Franklin. Um, as I said in my prior lecture, they were really open source guys. They weren't really into the patent system and the idea of temporary monopolies. So read about that as you go through. Uh, there's some other things of interest in here. Here's a graphic of one of the first patents was uh, for Oliver Evans. He was a pretty prolific inventor. And uh, this is a process, a business process or a manufacturing process that was patented. This is an entire flour mill where you know the wheat went in up here and it went through various stages of grinding and flour came out here. You can see these barrels of flour. So this is an early patent and it represents uh, a method patent. And even today you can get a manufacturing method or a business method patent if you're an inventor and, and you file such a patent at the U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark Office. So check that out. There's some other things that are interesting as you go through here. Here's an invention of an improved railroad car back in 1835, and the inventor claimed that this distributed the weight of the railroad car more evenly. Well, anybody can see that the railroad car's weight still ends up on two wheels, so this was not something that was examined uh, before a patent was granted, and that law changed in 1836. But again, there were many inventions prior to that time that really didn't work, and the reason that a patent was issued was because there was no requirement for the government to inspect any of the patents and, and uh, um, assure that, that they were accurate and they really worked. So something has to work. It has to be a viable patent in order to have a patent issued for it. So that's another interesting thing. Um, there are other things that have slipped through uh, patent examiners. Here is a uh, combination knife, fork, and spoon that received a patent in 1874, but it violated a couple of different prohibitions. First of all, it was an obvious invention, so any of us could say, hey, you know, a fork and a spoon might be a good thing to combine, but second of all, it was also harmful, it was dangerous, and you can't patent either one of those things. It can't be obvious, and it can't be harmful. So here's just an example of some things that slip through or slip by patent examiners in the patent office where patents were, were uh, actually issued and they shouldn't have been. Another thing, let's see, this is uh, Elias Howe's first sewing machine, 1846. Many of these, either you would, you would supply a working model to the patent office, and uh, that was required up until the 1970s, that you had to have a model of it, actually submit the model of the invention, or a miniature model if it was something big to the patent office. But they don't do that anymore. But again, uh, this was one of the first sewing machines patented in uh, the mid-1800s, and um, really, as far as the inventor goes, uh, Elias Howe, he made a lot of money on this. So, you know, that's not always the case. You'll read a little bit about Singer, uh, you'll read about Colt, you'll read about Eastman and the camera, Henry Ford. Um, you know, these business people, these inventors, really took the patent law seriously, and that's why it's important you read this article, because as we go down the road, farther in the semester, you're going to be reading about some of these guys and you're going to wonder why uh, patents were such a big deal. So again, patent law is a law. You cannot make something and sell it if it violates someone else's patent. You'll go to court and if you ignore it, eventually you'll be fined and you could even go to jail. So patents are serious business for inventors. Uh, you'll read about Morris, you know, the, the Telegraph and some other inventors, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, for example, that that uh, we catch down the road. You'll read about them in patents. So again, pay attention to this article. Here's an illustration of the Wright Brothers plane. What I want to point out here is that this is a patent drawing and you can see all of these numbers describing various parts on the plane. Um, I worked in patent law for about 10 years and I'm very familiar with patent drawings, patent art, and patent specifications. So the deal with a patent is that um, the government is granting you exclusivity or a monopoly to make your patent for a period of, now it's 20 years, it was 17 years for a while. Uh, but in order to do that, you're supposed to be able to kind of give the public 
this invention after your patent term has, has run out. So when you file a patent, it has to be detailed enough so somebody could build it without you there. In other words, these patent drawings give clear instructions on what all the parts are, and the patent specification, the actual text that a patent attorney writes, describes how the device goes together, and that's really important. So filing a patent isn't easy and it isn't cheap. Usually it costs up around $20,000 these days uh, to get a patent filed and to get it prosecuted and to get it all the way through to issuance. So again, um, you know, if you think you're going to make a new invention in your, in your garage and you're going to file a patent and get a utility patent issued, not a provisional patent, but a utility patent, then it's going to cost you a lot of money and it's not something uh, you can do on your own. You have to have a patent attorney work with you uh, to have it filed correctly. So again, read through this. Uh, it's an interesting article. I think you'll enjoy it. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.